I wanted to uh, do a little shout out uh, to our youth ministry. So last weekend on Saturday, our youth ministry had their annual uh, Italian dinner and silent auction. It's a, a fundraiser for their summer mission uh, trips. And uh, so this past weekend, uh, they set a record for the most money they've ever raised. After all the expenses were taken out, uh, over $7,000 was raised for, um, yeah. All of that money goes to support their trip. The uh, middle school and the high school students take uh, this year they're going to West Virginia. So I want to thank all of you who uh, went to the Italian dinner, all of those who um, gave baskets. I know a number of our small groups uh, put together and donated baskets that were part of the silent auction. Those of you who bid, those of you who work with our youth, I want to thank our youth as well who did an amazing job and of all those adults who work with our youth. Uh, and of course, our youth director, Jason Shin. Great job, and uh, yeah. It's just one more example of when a lot of people do a little bit, it makes a big difference, and uh, so I'm grateful for that. Happy Mother's Day. So, to those of you who are moms, happy Mother's Day to you. To those of you who are grandmas, who are aunts, or are uh, godmothers, or in some way are investing in the life of helping to raise a child, uh, happy Mother's Day to you. As we often say, it is the most important job that you will ever have, and the most difficult job that you will ever have. And uh, so we are grateful for you this morning. And, um, and part of what makes it so challenging, not that I need to tell you who are moms what makes your job challenging, um, but one of the things that I know makes it challenging is that every situation is different. Every circumstance is different. So my mom raised four kids, two boys and two girls, with 15 years between the oldest and the youngest. My wife raised two boys with 16 months between the oldest and the youngest. My mom uh, was a stay-at-home mom. Being a mom was her full-time job, and she believed that's the way it should be. My wife raised our two kids and had a career and believed that's the way <laughs> that it needed to be if she was going to survive. My mom, uh, or actually my wife, uh, one of the additional challenges she had is to be a mom to a special needs son. My mom had three very challenging children and one delight. <laughs> <laughs> and I know my older sister tunes in to our uh, streaming and so, Sharon, you know who I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, so happy Mother's Day to you guys. It, you know, at the center of any society is the nuclear family. That's where life begins. That's where our values and our perspectives and our characters are shaped in those nuclear families. So it's no surprise to me that when God decided to come to earth, that God decided to come into creation to take on human form and human family. If God had just kind of taken on human form and, and uh, taken on an adult body and just because he's God, just came to earth in that way, he would not have had the human experience. And so God chose to come to earth the same way that you and I and every human being comes through a woman. And in God's case, that woman was Mary. So why Mary? On this Mother's Day, thinking about Mary, why did God choose Mary? Well, it certainly wasn't because she was wealthy or influential or highly educated. Because Mary was a poor young woman 
who was born on the wrong side of the tracks, had very little formal education, and was engaged to a laborer. So those things that we so often highly value, things like wealth and positions and higher education, matter little in the kingdom of God, apparently. So why Mary? Why was Mary, in the words of Gabriel, so highly favored by God? And frankly, the Bible doesn't tell us. It doesn't give us a direct answer about why Mary, but there's some things that we know about her that we could point to, I think. One is that Mary was from the line of David, and that her lineage went back through King David. And the prophets foretold that the Messiah would come through the lineage of David. So she had that part of why God would choose her. I think another part of who she was, just part of her character, was that Mary was humble in the truest sense of humility. And as I was thinking about Mary and this incredible task that God gave her and how she expressed humility, I, I got thinking about another person who God had tasked with a big job, a guy named Moses, right? I want you to go and tell Pharaoh, let my people go, I'm gonna move them and you're gonna form uh, the, these enslaved people into a nation and ultimately it's gonna be Israel and it'll be the light to the nation, All big job, right? And Moses' response was, uh, no. No thanks, um, it's too big a job, I'm not smart enough, I'm not creative enough, I'm not articulated, articulate enough, I've got all this baggage in my past, thanks, but no thanks. And it kind of, you know, that kind of sounds like humility, right? Like, oh no, I could never, you know, gosh, oh pshaw, you know, I'm not that, I'm not that guy. That's not humility. That was fear. That was doubt. That was a lack of faith. It wasn't humility. When Gabriel appeared to Mary, her only question, when Gabriel laid out God's plan for her, her only question was a logistical, how is this gonna work? And when the angel told her that God was going to do a miraculous work in her life, in her body, a work of the Spirit, her response was, let it be to me as you've said. She didn't think, of course me. Of course me. I'm great. I'm awesome. Of course me. That's... Arrogance, right? Or she didn't think, it could never be me. There's this wrong with me, there's that wrong with me, there's all these reasons it shouldn't be me. That's not humility either. What Mary recognized is that God could have chosen any woman he wanted. And it wasn't hers to question why. She simply said, okay, and began the journey. To you moms who may be struggling right now, raising a child or children, and feeling constantly like you're a failure and that you aren't up for this task, I want you to know that God chose you to raise that child, to raise those children. And even if you may want to give them back, <laughs> God chose you to do this work. And so I just want to encourage you in that spirit of humility that Mary showed, that in the challenge of child raising, that you trust God that you pray constantly, that you seek and accept help from other women 
contemporaries as well as women who are uh, older, who have been there and done that, and that you believe in yourself. That's the nature of true humility. I think some of the other qualities that as you read the Gospels and where Mary is included, you'll read about uh, things, you'll, you'll see things in Mary like compassion, deep joy. This idea of joy, joy is um, a deep sense of well-being regardless of the circumstances. And Mary lived in some really challenging circumstances but just had this sense of well-being that we see. She was a woman of deep devotion. But I think the bedrock of who Mary was and part of why God might have chosen her was her abiding faith in God. She trusted God with every aspect of her life. Mary wasn't perfect. And when we try and create Mary into some idealized perfected woman we do an injustice to her and to her story and to the story of salvation she was not a perfect person but she was a woman of faith a deep and real faith I read one commentator who described Mary's faith as a blind faith she had blind faith and and saw that as a good thing and I think that's wrong I don't think Mary's faith was blind at all. I think she had an eyes wide open, clear eyed faith. She knew what was coming. When Jesus was just eight days old, she took him to the temple to be circumcised and Simeon, who uh, was, was there um, as a rabbi, saw him and knew that this was the promised Messiah and said out loud so that everybody could hear and including Mary and Joseph, that this child was going to be a transformational leader, that he was going to raise up many in Israel, but others would fall because of him, that it was going to be a difficult life that he was going to live and he would be misunderstood and so on and so forth. And then he said to Mary, and a sword will pierce your own soul as well. When Jesus was just a small child. She and uh, Mary and Joseph had to take him and flee to another country. They had to leave their home country because the king became aware that this Messiah had been born and couldn't find him, so ordered that every male child two years and younger would be slaughtered because he was so paranoid about this infant that would one day be king. Mary had a clear-eyed faith. She knew the challenges that she was facing. She knew the hardships that were coming, and she continued to trust God. Whatever other qualities God saw in Mary, he saw that she trusted him, and he in turn could trust her. God could trust Mary. Great example of that. Uh, in um, the Gospel of John, how, how God in Christ trusted Mary. So in John chapter 2, we read this. You may be familiar with the story. The next day, there was a wedding celebration in the village of Cana of Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples were invited to the celebration. The wine supply ran out during the festivities. So Jesus' mother told him they have no more wine. I love this part. Dear woman, that's not our problem, Jesus said. Right? My time has not come. 
But his mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. This is such, I love the story. It's such a human story at one level, right? Like, Mary is at this celebration, you know, it's friends of hers and she's excited for them and she's, you know, doing what folks do at weddings and, and uh, having a great time and so forth. But then sees that they are going to be running out of wine and this is going to be a big scandal and it's going to be an embarrassment to this family that she cares about and so forth. And Mary goes, I got a guy. I got, I got a guy. And goes over to Jesus and says, you know, they're out of wine. And Jesus says, mother, like, why are you, this is not our, this is not, I can't do anything. It's not my time. And I know, I just know that Mary gave him the mom look. Right? You all know the mom look, right? It was probably different for every mom, but you know the look. It's the look that goes, dear, don't argue with me. Do what I've told you. Just a look. Turns, walks away, tells the servants, do what he tells you to do. Right? At a deeper level, right? At a spiritual level, Jesus has not yet revealed himself and his power. He's been teaching, but he hasn't revealed that he has power over creation yet. And he's saying, I don't think it's time yet. And Mary says, no, 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 it's time. The time is now. And he trusted her in that moment and did his first miracle where he changed water into wine. Because Mary trusted God so fully, God trusted Mary and responded to her desire. Because God entered the world through a woman and into a family with parents and siblings, he got to be part of a family and experience life as we experience life with parents and siblings. And as important as that was for Jesus to be part of a family that he had a mom and that he had a dad. At Father's Day, we're gonna focus on Joseph. Jesus also teaches us something else about family. It's a story from the Gospel of Matthew. A little background on the story. Uh, Jesus is teaching in a village and there is a large crowd around listening to his teaching. Mary, his mother, and his siblings come to see Jesus and they can't get anywhere near him because the crowd is all around him. And they want to see him and they don't, you know, have the ability to, to text, you know, like, hey, Jesus, it's me, mom, come back and see me, you know, can't do that. So what I'm sure she did was they did the whisper down the lane thing. So they got you know, some guy in front, and Mary went, hey, I'm, I'm his mother. This is his brother. Would you tell him that I'm here? I need to talk to him. Okay, and he tells the next person in front, who tells the next person, who tells the next person. It finally, you know, gets up to Jesus. Hey, word is your mom and brothers are here, and they want to see you. Okay, so that's the background of the story. Here's where it picks up, Matthew 12, 48 to 50. Jesus asked, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? And then he pointed to his disciples and said, look, these are my mother and brothers. 
anyone who does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Is Jesus dissing his family? Right? No. Jesus is expanding our understanding of the nature of family in the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God, family is not limited to those people who were born into this nuclear gathering that we call family. But he's expanded that circle to say that anyone who has faith in me, any of my disciples, becomes part of this family. When Jesus Christ is central to our lives, we become family. In the truest sense of the word, we are brothers and sisters together in Christ Jesus. Earlier, you may recall that I said that it is family where life begins and where our values and our perspectives and our characters are formed, right? Well, in this new family, in the kingdom of God family, that's where our new life begins and our values and our perspectives and our characters are reformed in the image of Christ. It's the work that goes on in the life of the church in this family of God. So I want to acknowledge that not everyone here grew up in a safe and healthy nuclear family. And sometimes people choose not to come to church on Mother's Day or Father's Day because of their own experience of a neglectful or abusive or addicted or mentally ill parent. Grew up in deeply dysfunctional families. And my heart goes out to you because I know the wounds that that can leave on your life. But that's not the whole story on family. That's the beauty of what Jesus was teaching. Teaches us, shows us that there is this next kind of family. Not the one that you had, that you had no say over, but the one that you join as a part of your journey with Christ. And together, we are growing in Christ, having our perspectives and our values and our characters reformed together in Him. You know, when, when God laid a vision on me to start this church, it was never about to be the biggest church. It was always, though, about being a healthy family of faith where people could come as they are, who they are, to be accepted as they are and who they are and loved just that way, but loved too much to be satisfied with staying there. There's always a next step. And this is what we've said from the very beginning. No matter how mature your faith may be, no matter how long or how short you've been walking in faith, there is always a next step for you. God is never finished with you. There's always a next thing for you to learn, for you to experience, for you to do in the family of God. And so as we gather together on this Mother's Day, we get to thank not only the moms who raised us, but we get to acknowledge 
the women who have been a part of our faith life. The women who, as Heather prayed for, who spoke truth into our lives, who encouraged us, who taught us, who challenged us, who sometimes said hard things to us. We get to thank the women who are here this morning, here and online, who are part of this community of faith, and the ways that you bless this community. And when you invest your time and you invest your talents and your passions into the lives of kids that aren't yours or youth who aren't yours or you invest your time and your giftedness into a small group of other people or in the worship arts ministry or in our administrative work or in our hospitality work. When you invest yourself in the life of the community, you are making a difference in a profound way. You know, we started by talking about, um, <laughs> my dog is snoring, it just, sorry, it just <laughs> distracted me for a second. Hey, wake up. <laughs> sorry, that was total distraction right there. We talked about distractions last week and that was just mine. Anyway, the, um, I started by talking about the, the Italian dinner. You know, people invested in that. And it wasn't about a dinner. And it wasn't about money. It was about investing in an experience that our youth will have this summer as they go to another state and serve people that they don't know, give up a week of their, of their summer, and they're going to be, you know, sweating and working hard and so forth and having a great experience that's what we invested in. That's what family does for each other. And there may be one kid who that experience is transformational. And they will come back from that experience changed in some significant way that sets them on a whole new path that will influence everyone they touch for the rest of their lives. That's what happens in the family of God. And I am so grateful to be a part of it, so grateful that you're a part of it, and grateful, especially this morning, for the women who are a part of this community of faith. Would you stand with me as we close in prayer? And so, Lord God, we uh, give you thanks that You care so much for this community, this planet, the human race, that you chose to enter in in the same way that we all enter in. And that you chose a young woman not because of her greatness in human terms, but because of her faithfulness to you. We're thankful for her example and um, for the example of millions like her. And Lord, we give you thanks for the ways that you call us together, coming from different backgrounds, different families, different experiences, but call us together to be a new family, family of faith. And we're grateful, Lord, for the ways that you have used this family called Hope to bless lives of men and women, boys and girls over decades. And you continue to do that to this very day. We give you thanks and praise for that. And now, Lord, as we go into this new week, not knowing what the future holds, but knowing that you hold our future, we go into this new week with confidence, with hope, and with real faith, knowing that you are going to guide us each step along the way. 
and all of the praise, glory, and honor be yours, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And God's people agreed and said, Amen. have a great week, everybody.